Our next speaker is Kathleen DeRusso. I will let her introduce herself. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so hi, my name is Kathleen DeRusso, and I'm here to discuss some of the lessons that we've learned when balancing keyword and semantic search in these hybrid search use cases. And the theme of my talk is called retro relevance because I'm not really going to be talking about new concepts. A lot of them have been around for years, if not decades. They're just ideas that are still relevant now, and maybe they're coming back into vogue a little bit. And it wouldn't be a metaphor for retro without a quick metaphor for fashion. Because, you know, there's some things that should definitely stay in the past. Think powdered wigs. But there's other retro ideas like bell-bottom jeans. You know, 10, 20 years, every, every so often, they're going to come back into fashion. We're going to update them. We might improve them a little bit. We might put a little new spin on them, rebrand them with a different name, but they're the same concept and they work really well. So while semantic search has really revolutionized how we approach information retrieval using natural language processing and semantic intent, there are definitely challenges. It's a new and evolving field. And hybrid search and the tooling surrounding BM25 text search helps us solve a lot of these challenges. And a lot of the tools that I'll be talking about are like those bell-bottom jeans. They're never going to go out of style. They work, and they can help us overcome a lot of those challenges. They can make our search experiences better, and they can save us time. So I'm going to be listing some of those traditional tools and building blocks and, you know, things that have always worked to make lexical search better. And if you've tuned text search in the past, a lot of this is going to be really familiar. It might be old hat. But if you're coming into this field new from data science, AI, or machine learning, some of these might be new concepts to you. And uh, you know, we're gonna talk about the challenges that we face today with semantic search, and you know, talk about how hybrid search really is that best of both worlds. You know, highlight some of those tools in that relevance toolbox that helps us here. And you know, our goal is to make high quality, you know, search results as simple and most importantly, low effort as possible. You know, none of us really want to go back to the days of painstakingly tuning single weights here and there. I mean, there's nothing wrong if we do that for use cases, but it's a lot of work. So we want to make search and the application of things like business rules seamless and hands-off if we can, or as hands-off as possible for practitioners. And we can focus on making that semantic search and that hybrid search even better. Uh, before I start, who am I and why am I here talking to you? Uh, I'm a software engineer with years of application search experience. Uh, you know, I started off in a B2B space where we did uh, mostly lexical search and a lot of filters and a lot of business rules on things like electronic part numbers, where one character makes a huge difference. And, you know, totally different part numbers might be form fit function or functional equivalent uh, alternates. Um, and then I worked in the SaaS space where it wasn't a search company, but we used Elasticsearch uh, for really cool use cases like uh, building, uh, you know, backing up SaaS data from Microsoft 365 or G Suite and, you know, searching that metadata within specific backup windows to find that one email you deleted. So really interesting problems that had a different twist than typical keyword search. Uh, and today I'm at Elastic. I'm on the search relevance team here, and it's, uh, you know, it's a really great place to work. Uh, and because of that, and you know, the fact that I've also used Elasticsearch since 2.4, and it's, uh, you know, I've always been a big fan of it, um, the examples that I'm going to be using are all from Elasticsearch. Uh, but a lot of the general concepts should translate, even if you're not using Elasticsearch, even if the implementations might look a little different, the terminology, um, things like that. A uh, quick refresher on tech search. Um, you know, this is the tech search that we all know and love. You know, you're, you're taking text, you're translating it, you're parsing it, you know, you're turning it into keywords, you're analyzing it, you're creating those inverted document lists. And then, you know, this is how tech search has worked for decades. And, you know, there's tried and tested algorithms such as uh, TFIDF and BM25. And uh, because this is a retro talk, let's start with TFIDF. Term frequency over inverse document frequency. You know, how often does the term appear in the document? How, how often does it return in the index? And, you know, it was really one of those first ways to show how important a keyword in a document or a corpus is. And it was heavily used from 1972 in its inception through, I don't know, the early 2000s. But I want to put that in perspective as far as how old TFIDF is. It was introduced the same year of The Godfather, 
was introduced in theaters. VCRs were introduced that same year. I mean, everybody had one, and most of us probably no longer even have one. And Pong was an arcade game. Uh, so then after TF-IDF, we moved to BM25, 1994. You know, more advanced improvements like document length normalization, frequency saturation, you know, more accurate than TF-IDF. And BM25 is so heavily used today that it's actually a synonym for tech search. You know, when we talk about tech search, a lot of times we just say BM25 search and you know what we mean. And while personally it pains me to think that the 90s were not 10 years ago, <laughs> think of the 90s as retro, uh, you know, BM25 is as old as Forrest Gump. Or, you know, when we were collecting Beanie Babies is when it was introduced. Or this company had this weird idea to start a bookstore online. So, uh, you know, this is all meant to say that it's been around for a little while. So all of this technology that's been around for a while, there's a lot of tools in this lexical search toolbox that we have when we've used these algorithms like TF-IDF and BM25. You know, and at the heart of it is these analyzers and tokenizers, you know, pre-processing our text before we search. And this gives us a ton of functionality. You know, you're talking white space tokenization or punctuation handling or stop word removal, which isn't quite really as used as much today, but um, you know, it's, it's still something that we used in the past. Case normalization, stemming, lemmatization. So basically anything where you have to map custom characters or use these pre-processed characters before you tokenize, this is the stuff that these analyzers just shined at. And of course, the uh, traditional filters, field wastes, and boosts. You know, these filters over structured data can isolate that specific content that you want to search on much more effectively than straight up text search or even semantic search. Um, you know, for books, uh, some examples might be author or genre or publication date. And, you know, the standard example for boosts is that titles are probably going to be more important than description or metadata. But, you know, boosts can get really sophisticated, you know, think geo distance boosts or popularity or frequency. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, people have worked on for decades and it's built into the search software and it can help you in this type of uh, type environment. Of course, there's re-ranking, uh, you know, learn to rank strategies are a huge part of that, but also personalization, contextual re-ranking. And now today we're going into semantic re-ranking. Um, so that's, you know, again, it, it's an important tool in the toolbox. Synonyms, you know, for slang, for domain specific jargon. And, you know, synonyms in particular, when you're using semantic search, not all models are gonna handle them well. And, you know, especially if they're very niche to like a specific company or a specific domain. And finally, we have business rules. And business is, rules encompass a huge amount of custom rules. But there's some common use cases that bubble up to the top here. Uh, for example, we might want to ensure a diverse set of results. Maybe we don't want every single result on our result page to be from the same company. Maybe we want a couple results from a lot of different companies. Or maybe we want to run targeted ads that are based on contextual query results or other personalization factors. And these business rules might not necessarily be affected by relevance. They actually might even be contradictory to relevance. But, you know, it's really important to combine relevance with these business rules that, you know, uh, first of all, they're going to pay the bills and, uh, you know, they might be uh, contractually obligated to do this or, or whatever reason. But, you know, we need to have these rules on top of, you know, that pure relevance that we want to, um, that we want to achieve. So, a uh, quick refresher on semantic search. Uh, we've already gone through this in a few processes, so I'm going to go through it really quickly. But, you know, you're going to take these text strings, you're going to translate them into an embedding model and to arrays of floating point numbers or dense vectors. And we're going to search on them using that approximate neighbor, nearest neighbor, the ANN search, or brute force KNN search. Um, alternately, we can use learn sparse retriever models. Uh, and we can represent this as a list of tokens and weights. And we can use those to expand that original text that came in to get the alternate ways of, of using those words. And then at query time, your text queries run through that same embedding model. 
And, you know, it's also important to note that vectors can be used for a lot of different use cases beyond the traditional semantic search retrieval. You know, they can be used for personalization or summarization. And it's also important to note that they don't have to be used for straight up retrieval. You know, what about rescoring or filtering or that semantic re-ranking and so on? Um, you know, and re-ranking is really a huge con concept right now, whether it's, uh, you know, LTR for BM25 search or that semantic mid or final re-ranking. It's a huge asset, especially when your models are not going to return the right answer in the very top result. And it can be really powerful and really helpful. And, uh, you know, just time for a shameless plug here for Elastic. Uh, semantic uh, re-ranking is something that we're actively working on. Uh, we just launched native re-ranking support using Cohere, and there's a lot more in the pipeline that's coming. Uh, so it's something that we're continually making easier to use and, and more in, built in and supported as a, you know, a first class member of our search. Uh, but again, you know, this is just really more of a summary of uh, what the, um, you know, what the tools are. Now, semantic search is really cool in so many ways, you know, that, you know, intent of what you're looking for and, you know, returning results that don't have the keyword that you actually searched for. First few times you use it, it's magic. And, you know, because of that, there's so many buzzwords right now, you know, there's semantic search and rag and chatbots and every single company wants one and it's going to revolutionize every business, right? And, uh, you know, it's, not without some pitfalls, you know, it, it, it's great that search is cool again, but if you're developing a search application and you've got a legacy tech stack and you're trying to incorporate semantic search into this tech stack, there's definitely some pitfalls that you need to think about. And these largely fall under three different categories. There's cost, there's features that semantic search might not do well at yet because, you know, again, this is new, it's evolving. And, you know, we're working on a lot of these solutions, but some things it doesn't do well with yet. And then there's also certain queries that, you know, again, uh, right now, semantic search doesn't always do great with. So let's start with cost. Cost can be money or it can be time. And, you know, time can be latency, but it can also be developer time and, you know, our time spending tuning a lot of these models. And, you know, so what makes semantic search costly? There's the obvious. Models aren't cheap. You know, it, training and fine tuning your model takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort and it takes money. And, you know, a lot of companies don't have the resources nor, frankly, the desire to do this but your results are only as good as the model that you use, right? So you might wanna license a model that's already available. If you're not using a free one, this also costs money. And no matter where you get your model from, there's gonna be memory requirements and there's gonna be compute, directly translates into dollars. And furthermore, inference can be slow. So, you know, you can throw more hardware at the problem, but you know, to speed up these queries and ingest, but that also translates into dollars. Um, but finally, there's that other cost, and that's developer time. And, you know, maybe you're a manager who's responsible for headcount and salaries, or you're a product owner who is responsible for, you know, delivering as much, you know, value on your roadmap as possible. Or maybe you're an engineer like myself who has a finite number of hours in any given day. You know, we don't want to spend our valuable time on things that can easily be solved with tools. You know, it, this is definitely a cost, and if you're not doing things efficiently, you may be spending too much of that valuable time on the wrong problems. So why don't we spend that time and save it to focus on solving those non-trivial and hard problems that require that engineering focus? You know, things like chunking or query understanding, you know, things that help with a lot of these problems directly impacts relevance. Uh, so, you know, you need to decide what problems that you want to spend that engineering time to solve. And we were currently, you know, and always continuously working on lowering that development cost, making things easier to onboard, uh, making it easier to use semantic search with minimal setup and lowering the costs of things like chunking. You know, uh, now that we're supporting things like nested documents and joining those nested passages with our parent documents. So everything is getting better, but as we're, you know, that doesn't help us now, things that are on the roadmap for a month from now, we still need to make those trade-offs and figure out how to make those solutions in the, in the meantime. 
Um, as far as features that people have come to expect in search solutions, things that you know product people and UI UX people think of as table stakes in in search, you know things like highlighting, uh, you know spelling correction, typo tolerance. Um, you know, HODL is a great example. Is it a typo or is it, you know, Reddit GameStop slang? Um, you know, so these are all of things that semantic search can struggle with out of the box today with no additional refinement. But again, user functionality, these are just things that are expected and these are things that should work today and need to work today. And as far as queries that semantic search might not do well with, you know, we're talking these niche queries that require exact matches. Uh, you know, for example, these model numbers. Uh, the example is a USB A to USB C connector, uh, but you know, one character different, and you might get a completely different model number, or other domain specific jargon or business rules. You know, if you want to adjust your relevance based on popularity or conversions or even marketing campaigns, it's really hard to do this with semantic search out of the box. Um, and query understanding is another huge problem. You know, there's some easy use cases here like conversions and units of measurements that semantic search doesn't do great at today. But another great example is negatives. So try using semantic search for um, a restaurant that doesn't serve meat. Now, some LLMs, ChatGPT might do an okay job of giving you some vegetarian restaurants, but a lot of these models, they're gonna say meat and they're gonna give you results that serve meat because that's what you asked for. So, you know, those are the hard problems that we want to be solving. And those are the problems that, you know, are coming next. So those are what we want to be focusing on. All right, so, you know, hybrid search comes to the rescue here. You know, it's the precision and the functionality of BM25, and it's the semantic understanding of vector search. It's the best of both worlds in terms of both recall and relevance. But that's a big mouthful. So what do I mean by that? So some specific examples of some cases where you might not get what you want from BM25 and you might not get exactly what you want from pure semantic search, but combine it and it's really powerful. You know, think about real estate where, you know, I've got specific filters like an in-ground pool or a zip code and, uh, you know, I've got semantic text. Uh, E-commerce, you know, I've got a brand name and a color and then I've got semantic intent. Or a movie where I might know the genre and, um, you know, an actor, but I forgot the title. Or job hunting where I know it's remote and I know the job title, but the skills are much more subjective and they benefit from that semantic analysis. Uh, or finally books. Again, you've got the genre and you've got a description. And, but, you know, if, you, if you're looking for the title of the series, um, you know, sorry about any spoilers in the last one, but the, in my defense, the first book is almost as old as BM25. Um, so, you know, what do all of these have in common? It's that content that's specific to filter on and then also something more vague that benefits from semantic analysis. And, you know, the phrase hybrid search is really buzzwordy right now. And, you know, in some systems where, you know, you've got a separate vector database and you might have to call different data stores and combine them and use services to do this. One of the superpowers of Elasticsearch, though, is that all of this can be combined in one single index and one single search call. So there's a few different ways that we can do this. And when I'm talking about hybrid search, it might be as simple as a good, old-fashioned Boolean query. So an example, you know, here's an example, but in Elasticsearch, you can have Boolean queries that combine text search and KNN search and text expansion and any other supported query type that you want to use. And, you know, if you're using text search today, you might already be using Boolean queries with, you know, various tiered relevance clauses that accommodate a lot of those business rules and a lot of these custom things that match, you know, rank certain matches higher than others. And, you know, since it's a query, it can be combined with things like rescores and re-ranking, and it's really powerful. It's a super easy way to combine these text and vector searches into one single query. Um, and there's one other thing that I really want to call out about this particular example because it's kind of new in Elasticsearch 8.12. And uh, that's the fact that KNN is not just a top level query. It's, you know, you know, or a top level search, I should say. It's actually a query so that it can be nested in to that Boolean query and you can use it just as any other query where the K is actually the size of the query. 
Um, so it's a really awesome change. It's super powerful. And, uh, you know, the author of that PR actually happens to be in this room with me at Haystack. So uh, definitely say hi to her if you uh, see her later. Um, but there's other options as well. So, uh, you know, you can use sub searches and you can combine multiple searches and apply a ranking strategy over these different query results. Um, you know, so in this case, you can still combine every single query that you did in the, in the um, Boolean example, you know, text searches and semantic searches. You could use that text expansion query or KNN or any other type of search and then roll them up with a specific relevance and ranking strategy. And uh, this example uses RRF, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about shortly. Um, but it is important to know that, um, you know, this type of hybrid search is a really quickly evolving field. Um, the entire field is evolving to handle this and make easier and better approaches to do this. So in Elasticsearch, in the future, we will be replacing the sub searches idea with something called retrievers. And this is an easier way of describing these complex retrieval pipelines. Uh, so this is uh, basically doing the same thing as the sub searches where you're combining these standard queries as retrievers and KNN queries. And it's again all rolled up to use RRF to rank the results. So while this isn't available yet, hopefully really soon you'll be able to play with it. But now you've got your hybrid search. And how do you combine everything into a single result set? And this is a really hard problem, especially when these scores are virtually guaranteed to be significantly, to be vastly different, depending on how the results were retrieved. You know, there's that classic way using the Boolean query example where we use uh, linear boosts. You know, you can apply different boosts to each individual clause in that larger Boolean query. And that's a tried and true, nice old technology, um, but it's finicky. It requires a lot of tuning to get right, and you might never ever get it perfect. Uh, so if you're using sub searches or retrievers, you can also use RRF or reciprocal rank fusion. You know, it's published research that combines these result sets for you. Um, and in fact, my colleague Philip Kren did a talk on RRF specifically at Haystack Europe in September of last year. So the video is online. It's a great reference, um, you know, along with a lot of our great Search Labs content if you want to learn more about RRF in particular. Um, but the power of RRF is that it's easier. You know, you don't have to tune. You don't have to do that tuning. You just rely on the algorithm to do it for you. Magic, right? But there's trade-offs. You're gonna have less fine-grained control over those result sets. And there's also some little UX limitations. Uh, some, many of these we're actively working on now, but for today, you know, if your site depends on traditional pagination or pinned documents, you can't just plug RRF as a replacement out of the box and expect it to work exactly the same as traditional search does today. Um, and, you know, it doesn't take that BM25 boosting into account. And that's the, the trade-off for, um, you know, take, going away from that fine-grained control. So if you're boosting on things like those business rules or if you have, um, you know, other, other BM25 boosts that you want, you're, you're probably not going to get the results that you want right out of the box. So, you know, there's, there's really a lot of trade-offs there. Um, but ultimately, the method that you use really depends on your data, your use case, what you need to get out of it, and the time that you want to spend on it. But, you know, RRF is going to continue to evolve. Uh, you know, we're actively working on adding functionality to it, addressing some of these limitations, and it will continue to improve, and it will be continue to be a much more compelling solution and a much more compelling alternative. Uh, but you do have to choose the best option for your use case and, and know the trade-offs to both. So now you've done the work, you've got that semantic query, or better yet, that hybrid query, and then it encapsulates everything that you want, including your business rules. Now, how do you know it's better? You know, the most important is business metrics, you know, things from analytics, you know, clicks, or better yet, in e-commerce, are they completing purchases, conversion rates, are users spending a decent amount of time reading the content on your site, you know, measuring that user experience that are gathered through those analytics as direct proof that your search is, if not providing the results that are correct, at least engaging and useful. Um, and, you know, this is probably the best slash only way to measure things like RAG, where the results are custom, they're subjective, and they're almost guaranteed to change. 
Um, you know, you can consider going down the road of user surveys. Um, you know, asking users if they thought the results were good and bad. There's considerations there. Are users going to tell the truth? Are only users that are unhappy going to respond? Um, but, you know, it's important to thought, think about those old school quantitative ways that measure uh, that you're returning what you want. Ugh. Words are hard. The old school ways that um, to measure that you're returning what you want to. You know, uh, is your recall good? Is your precision good? And, you know, those uh, metrics like mean average precision and NDCG really help with that. Um, and of course, the gold standard is to have that repeatable evaluation requiring those judgment lists on what's relevant versus not. But these take different forms and they do require varying levels of work to create. Um, you know, you could buy a sample set of data with judgment lists, but how relevant is that for your use case? Um, you know, you can mine data from analytics and see what users are clicking on, but that might inject some noise based on click bias or, you know, people not necessarily clicking on exactly the best result. Um, so, you know, manually creating those judgment lists and investing that time, it is time consuming and it can be very subjective. Um, you know, a good way of proving that manual sub, um, creation of these judgment lists is, subject, is subjective, get three people in a room and ask them to agree on what the relevance and what the order of the results should be. You're probably gonna get three different answers each time, um, but it does have value. And uh, once you have that judgment list though, you know, the world is your oyster. Um, you know, you can measure your re relevance, but more importantly, you can start using it in learn to rank algorithms. Um, you know, uh, time for another shameless plug here, but Elasticsearch actually has a native learn to rank support uh, is in, it's currently in tech preview right now, but um, you know, we're bringing this right into the stack and, and it's available to use right out of the box. Um, so, you know, this is something that's probably worth that development time. It's worth that development time investment. Um, but I did want to talk about the single biggest trap that everybody falls into at least once when you're tuning relevance. And that's tuning for one or maybe even a few pet queries. And you know the ones, the ones that you type in when you test your search results or maybe your boss types in when they test the search results. And that first result isn't great. So, you know, you can change everything about your relevance algorithm to try to get that one good result, but how much damage are you going to do to the rest of your relevance algorithm to tune for that one or two pet queries? And, uh, you know, you know, there's really, without those um, quantitative res measurements of, uh, of relevance, you don't even know what damage you're doing downstream from that. But we've got some tools for that. So if you remember that pet query, you can still have great results for that pet query and you don't have to modify your relevance algorithm. And uh, this is through the concept of uh, pinned or promoted documents. And, uh, you know, I think every, if not, or maybe most search providers have this uh, type of functionality, but they might use different verbiage around it. Um, but at Elastic, we call these query rules, and essentially it's a way to send in some type of context. Let's say it's a user entered query string, but it doesn't have to be. And if it matches some criteria that we have stored, we can configure specific documents that we want to rank first, second, third, etc. And, uh, you know, one of the biggest use cases of query rules is, again, this application of business rules. Because sometimes those pet queries are directly related to relevance. You know, sometimes you've got to fix relevance. But sometimes they're not. Uh, for example, maybe you want to promote certain companies. Or maybe you've got somebody who's, you know, worst case scenario, threatening to pull a deal if, if, if you don't fix relevance for when they're searching for their company name. Uh, or maybe you want to promote different content to users based on zip code. Uh, for example, you know, I live in New York. If I'm searching for baseball related content, I'm much less likely to engage in something about Boston Red Sox than I am about New York Yankees. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of use cases here and we can use query rules to quote unquote fix relevance for these pet queries. Um, you know, with the disclaimer that, you know, overall relevance shouldn't be nitpicky. You know, we want to rely on things like models and, uh, you know, ranking and re-ranking and even RRF to get it right. 
But let's be honest, there's always going to be one or two exceptions to that rule. And that's where, you know, query rules is kind of the easy button to just fix it and get it right, move on with our day and not spend too much of our time on it. Um, you can go further. Uh, you know, you can go through your head queries and try to, you know, make sure that we can guarantee that good search experience for the top, you know, I don't know, 100 queries or whatever the, the number would be. Um, but, you know, and it's not cheating. Uh, you know, ju you're just guaranteeing that, you know, the users that are doing these very commonly entered queries are getting a great search experience. Um, but the, like the other benefit to things like query rules is that you don't have to be the person that manages it. You can set it up and, you know, you can have non-search practitioners, maybe somebody who's running a marketing campaign. They can be responsible for choosing those documents to pin. So how does this work? So elastic query rules are defined by uh, creating what's called a query rule set. It's a list of one or more rules. Each rule has the criteria that must match the rule in order for the query to be applied and then the actions that we take on the rule if it matches. Uh, right now, pinned documents are what's supported, but you know, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but you know, a rule can have multiple criteria based on the metadata that you send in from the client. You might have more, uh, you know, more data like a user ID or whatever available in the client that you can send in for these rules. Uh, so in this example, there's a user query string and we knew their location. So we sent both of them in the rule. Uh, both of those criteria would have to be met in order for that rule to be considered a match and the action to be taken. Um, and then to access those rules at search time, you send in that corresponding rule query that specifies the metadata that you want to match on. And if you don't have any matches, it just runs that organic query as is and, you know, it's it, nothing gets pinned. Uh, we will apply every single matching rule in the rule set in the order that it's specified. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll pin all of those documents that you want to come back. And, you know, I'm personally working on plans to make this feature generally available and adding and extending functionality to it. Uh, for example, um, you know, one thing in the roadmap is supporting tokenizers and analyzers, which is going to be really powerful to match on a lot, um, you know, a more broad uh, set of content. Um, and, you know, we're also going to be making it easier for those non-technical people to manage query rules as part of campaigns. And, um, you know, in the future, I really want to provide additional actions on top of just pinning those documents. For example, um, you know, if you're searching for something that has Skechers in it, let's pin a brand name or, you know, uh, rewrite the query to have that brand name. Uh, so those are things that I, uh, you know, hope will be coming soon in the future. Um, and, you know, that's kind of where the vision can go is turn that more into something that can help with those, some of those query understanding use cases, as well as some of those ads and campaigns. Um, but if you don't use Elasticsearch, this type of pinned document, uh, you know, it can be managed in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, a lot of search applications already handle this in some way or the other. Um, worst case, if yours didn't, you know, you could manage this with like a CMS that uh, modifies the query before it's sent into the search engine. Um, but, you know, I think that this is becoming a lot easier to use and administer uh, because it is so powerful to kind of correct some of those imbalances, especially with hybrid search. And, you know, again, we're talking about that cost savings in terms of time again. Um, and now let's talk about synonyms. Um, you know, again, that's that domain specific jargon that's unique to your business. It's not in any current models. Um, you know, one anecdotal example is um, Elastic has its own learned uh, sparse encoder or sparse encoder model. Uh, it's called Elser. And when we first launched Elser, my favorite dog is a puggle. It's a cross between a pug and a beagle. I searched for puggles in Elser and it did not know that it was part related to dog. And, you know, this is a really specific use case. I still brought it up to the team. Um, and my colleagues had a lot of fun debating on whether a puggle was actually a dog. Um, I've got the mic, so I'm going to tell you it's a dog. Uh, but, you know, this is a, a good use case, you know, as silly as it is of a case where, hey, the model doesn't have this data, but synonyms can help. Um, you know, and, and it's in all seriousness, synonyms are a great way of, uh, you know, kind of translating this domain specific terminology, this slang, these alternate ways of saying a word that might be too specialized for that model to return with the relevance that we want. 
Um, and in Elasticsearch, we used to manage this in a way that was kind of a pain. There was a lot of manual overhead. Uh, you know, you had to create a synonyms file, you had to upload it, you had to reload analyzers. So we recently updated this to use a synonyms API. Um, and, you know, it's very similar to query rules where you create a synonym set, you define one or more synonyms, and we've got a CRUD API that adds, updates, removes synonyms, and reloads those analyzers for you. So it's uh, pretty easy to use. And then you can update those mappings uh, to define a custom analyzer that uses the synonym set. The nice thing about synonyms being an analyzer is tying it back to query rules. When we do get around to supporting analyzers and query rules, synonyms can be supported out of the box, which is, uh, you know, again, a really powerful functionality. Um, and if you're not using Elasticsearch again, you know, synonyms are one of those tried and true technologies. It's been used for years, and I'm pretty sure every tech search implementation has some form of them. Uh, so those are some of the tools that we have, uh, but what I really want you to get out of this talk is that semantic search doesn't replace BM25 search, it's only an enhancement to it. And hybrid search solves a lot of those problems that are innate to semantic search, making it that best of both worlds. And it really shines. So semantic search really shines when you're talking those long tail and those torso queries, because in a lot of organizations, you've probably already optimized those head queries to make sure that the common queries have the best relevance already. And you know, these tools like query rules and synonyms can help free that time up and provide the best search experience possible. And you know, a lot of these concepts and tools have been around for a long while. And you know, as that landscape evolves, we're getting better and better at solving some of those hard problems and solving some of those pitfalls with semantic search um, and making it really easier to use semantic search and hybrid search through simplification and tooling. And that's only gonna continue. Um, you know, but our goal as search practitioners is to return the best results possible. And our other goal is to do it as easily as possible with minimal cost, including money or time. Um, and, you know, we don't want to waste that valuable engineering time. We want to spend it solving those hard problems. So remember, like bell bottoms, retro relevance is in fashion again. Uh, and while I still have the mic, I want to mention that a lot of those hard problems that we're solving, you know, Elasticsearch engineers are actively working on to bring it into the stack to make it better. You know, tooling and search optimization and semantic re-ranking, vector search optimizations. And, you know, we're really working on that next generation of search tools. And if that sounds compelling to you, we're hiring. We've got some great career openings uh, on our career page, including engineering roles working directly with vector search. So uh, we're happy to talk with you if uh, that's something that you find interesting. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few questions. Are there any, oh, make me run all the way up. Just now I realized I could beat you halfway. You could have, but didn't. you didn't. I didn't. <laughs> Next That's time. Because you're an engineer. <laughs> Great talk, thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, this is kind of gonna be an elastic specific question, but one of the things that we've been really interested in is RRF and Elastic's kind of new getting into LTR. Um, with e-commerce, one of the issues we face is with product variants and not wanting to kind of show the same variants of a single product all right next to each other in search results. So there's a few ways of handling that with either nested documents, um, parent-child relationships, one thing we've been interested in is in field collapse, but field collapse seems to be kind of almost behind a little bit. It doesn't have support for RRF or for LTR. And I'm curious about the future of field collapse, if that's something that will kind of be supported with these new features or not. Uh, great question. Um, so I'm going to be honest, I'm not 100% sure of the product roadmap with field collapse. I don't know if uh, some of my colleagues are. Yeah. All right. So my colleague Maya uh, answered this in the audience, but to repeat for the people in Zoom, thank you, Maya. Um, while this isn't currently something that we support, this type of feedback is super valuable. Uh, so yeah, if you um, 
uh, you know, add an issue to our uh, GitHub repo and we can get some community engagement on it and get some, some traction on it. That is one great way of getting it into our attention and possibly even onto our roadmap. Um, so that's a great example. Um, you know, we also have a community Slack where, you know, kind of, or, or discuss forums where you can kind of bring that type of suggestion to us. Um, and it would be great if, uh, you know, if, if that's something that you'd be willing to do. And I'd love to continue the conversation there. Vishal Patel. <coughs> Vishal Patel, you mentioned earlier in the talk that embeddings can be used for personalization and summarization. Can you please explain how? In two sentences or less. In, in two sentences or less, they can't. It's not natively supported in Elasticsearch, but um, if I'm restricted to uh, two sentences or less, I'll say, uh, you know, use models and use microservices. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I think during the query rules section, you mentioned that it currently only supports pinned queries or pinned documents. I'm wondering if there's plans to expand that to like use a custom sort or a function score or something. Yeah, we're uh, actively talking with product about a lot of these functionalities. Um, so this is actually another uh, case where if there's something specific that you'd like, this is actually the perfect time to open issues or engage with us and discuss because we're actively talking about what the roadmap is for this. Um, so, so yeah, like if there's uh, specific things for uh, uh, script scoring or uh, you know rescoring re that you know, would be contextually rule-based. I'd love to hear more about it. And maybe we can even chat a little bit more, uh, you know, at this conference. Juan Feng Ma, in many search scenarios, BM25 search often returns much more results than semantic search due to the limitation of performance. Is there a lesson learned on how to balance and merge the results? Uh, so that depends, um, because sometimes when you're using, uh, for example, text expansion, it's actually the opposite where, uh, you know, where, where you have a lot of these vectors, you're going to be getting way more of those results. Um, so as far as merging, honestly, like if, 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 if that's something that's difficult to tune, I think that's one of the use cases where RRF is something you should definitely experiment with, uh, because that should take you know, uh, irregardless of score, it should take a lot of that um, complexity away. And, and you know, the ideal for that is that we're going to be using that and we're going to be merging the results in a much uh, more seamless and much more hands-off way. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm Stavros Vakrakis from OpenSearch. Uh, we have many of the same features, of course. Uh, I just wanted to say, since you're shameless about saying you're hiring, uh, I'll mention that a lot of the things you're talking about are also available in open source. So Quirky, for example, has a rules engine that's been around for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, you know, we agree with you on uh, our, our research uh, supports almost everything you said. So we're in complete agreement on lots of things. And there are lots of tools out there that people can use. All right, thank you. Gulam Sarwar, have you faced a situation where LTR or hybrid system variant shows improvement in NDCG performance during model testing, but when that model is put in prod, the engagement-based metrics used for A-B tests don't perform well? If so, how do you reevaluate this variant? So I don't think that we're at that point yet, um, but we have been doing a lot of internal uh, you know, uh, modification and optimization of hybrid search for use cases on our site. So, you know, six months from now, we might have more answers to, you know, with, um, you know, specific content from that. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, uh, what I can tell you is that we experimented anecdotally and, you know, kind of uh, manually creating some of those judgments with um, you know, using our ELSER model for, for semantic search, using just straight up BM25 text search. And we found the best results were using hybrid search, and that's currently what's merged into our code base. Um, but this uh, is, I'm not privy to what the results of the A-B testing have been yet, because it's pretty new, but it's something that I hope that 
the people that are running that um, will be uploading and will be writing blogs about to try to share some of their learnings on our search labs site. So hopefully we'll be getting more you know, insight onto that at some point in the future. And we have time for one more question. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, Jonathan Fries here from Shipped. Two things. One, uh, we actually asked you guys to open the Collapse Rescore feature, and um, it actually is on the roadmap apparently now. So uh, there's a GitHub issue you can already look at. Uh, the other question I had is there was a slide where you mentioned with RRF um, that pagination is not trivial. Uh, what's what's your sort of approach to that, and you know how would you say someone should go about paginating in that type of workflow? So the reason that it's not trivial for uh, people who might not be aware is the fact that like okay, let's say you get your first ten results and you rank them, and you know it works pretty well, right? You get to the second page of results, and maybe something from that second page of results get re gets re ranked by RRF and is now on the first page of results. So things shift around a little bit. Unfortunately, oh, sorry, you okay? Um, unfortunately, the only way around that right now is to um, basically always request and always re-rank everything using RRF on the max result window that you want to display. Not ideal for performance, uh, but I believe that we're going to be addressing that through with retrievers. So hopefully uh, pagination will be better at some point in the near future. All right, let's, let's thank our speaker again. And it's time for lunch. Good luck, find food. <laughs> <laughs>